no answers on the origin of the vertebrate immune system. No, they certainly do not. My argument is that these articles have no detailed, rigorous explanations for how complex biochemical systems could arise by a random mutation in natural selection. And these articles do not address that. And then he starts to say, well, have you read this book, Dr. Behe? And he starts to pile these up on Behe's witness stand. Eventually, Behe was almost dwarfed by the stack of scientific literature on the evolutionary origin of the immune system. All these hard-working scientists published article after article over years and years, chapters and books, full books, addressing the question of how the vertebrate immune system evolved. But none of them are satisfactory to you. That's a lawyer's trick. Purely a lawyer's trick. Now, you know, was Michael Behe going to read every one of those books before he responded? You know, it was uh, totally theatrics. Mr. Rothschild, would you like your books back? They're heavy. The defense case included three expert witnesses. And on the last day of testimony, the final defense witness told the court about a creature that by now was familiar to everyone. I'm Dr. Scott A. Minnick. I'm an associate professor at the University of Idaho in microbiology. Dr. Minnick, can you give us an example of design at the molecular level? This is a bacterial flagellum. Uh, this is a system I work with. Uh, we've seen that? I know. You're going to see a little more of it, Your Honor. I kind of feel like Zsa Zsa's fifth husband here, you know. Uh, as the old adage goes, I know what to do, I just can't make it exciting. But I'll try. <laughs> now, you specialize your focus and research on the flagellum, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. And you've done experiments on the flagellum? I have. And you've written peer-reviewed articles on it? Yes. Now, Dr. Minnick, a complaint that's often brought up, and plaintiffs' experts have brought it up in this case, is that intelligent design is not testable. It's not falsifiable. Would you agree with that claim? No, I don't. I have a quote here from Mike Behe. In fact, intelligent design is open to direct experimental rebuttal. To falsify such a claim, a scientist could go into the laboratory, place a bacterial species lacking a flagellum under some selective pressure, for motility, say, grow it for 10,000 generations and see if a flagellum or any equally complex system was produced. If that happened, my claims would be neatly disproven. Is that an experiment that you would do? You know, I think about it. Uh, I'd be intrigued to do it. I wouldn't expect it to work, but that's my bias. Now, you claim intelligent design can be tested, correct? Correct. Intelligent design, according to you, is not tested at all, because neither you nor Dr. Behe have run the test that you yourself advocate for testing intelligent design, right? Well, turn it around in terms of these major attributes of evolution. Have they been tested? You see what I'm saying, Steve? It's a problem for both sides. As the legal teams battled it out in court, the clash between intelligent design and evolution was taking a toll on Dover. Local newspaper reporter Lori Lebo sat through every day of testimony, and the conflict began to drive a wedge between Lori and her father. He believed that God really should be in science class. He did not believe in science. And he was all worried about me and because I believed in evolution. And he said, you know, well, do you really believe that we came from monkeys? <laughs> At that point, I was, I was pretty burnt out from the trial, and I didn't really have the patience that I probably should have had with him. And I just said, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, I do believe in evolution, Dad. And so we'd fight every morning. If you believe in heaven and hell and you believe you have to be saved, nothing else could possibly matter. Not the First Amendment, not science, not rational debate. You, you, all that matters is that you're going to be rejoined with the people you love most on this earth. Teaching the traditional evolutionary Darwinian concept that man evolved from lower uh, or forms of life, that's almost a slap in my face. That takes the dignity away from humanity as far as I'm concerned. What gives dignity to man is that every one of us are made in the image of God. He is the creator. 
and he created the world with intention and with design. It upsets me deeply that now in our educational system we are indoctrinating our young people to think differently about humanity. I've never made a secret of the fact that I'm a Roman Catholic and a long tradition of scholarship in the Catholic Church has argued that truth is one, that science and religion should ultimately be in harmony. But that doesn't make faith a scientific proposition. I think, as many religious people do, that faith and reason are both gifts from God. And if God is real, then faith and reason should complement each other rather than being in conflict. Throughout the trial, Judge Jones would never tip his hand about which way he was leaning on whether intelligent design is science. But science was not the only issue before the court. The climax of the trial would be the judge's ruling on a question stemming from a different line of evidence. When they introduced intelligent design into the classroom, were members of the Dover School Board motivated by religion? If so, that would amount to a violation of part of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the Establishment Clause, which mandates the separation of church and state. In order to prevail, we needed to prove either that the school board acted for the purpose of promoting religion or that its policy has the effect of promoting religion. It's, the, it's, it's either purpose or effect, either one. The Establishment Clause says that Congress cannot pass a law which promotes uh, one religion over another. And that trickles all the way down to any state action, and in this case, the actions of a uh, school board. But what evidence was there that the school board was motivated by religion? Months before the trial, when Bertha Spar had unpacked the boxes containing the 60 copies of pandas given by an anonymous donor, she found a clue. I was directed by the administration to unpack the boxes, count the books, stamp and number them. In the bottom of the box, I found a catalog. I opened the catalog to see what they had to say about the book in question. And at the very top of the catalog page, it was listed under creation science. This should certainly be a smoking gun and would be a benefit to us somewhere down the road. This information was handed off to the National Center for Science Education. The NCSE was helping the lawyers who were arguing to keep intelligent design out of Dover High School. Knowing of pandas and people would be central to the case, Nick Motsky investigated the book. When the court case was filed and pandas was adopted in the policy, it became clear that pandas was going to be the representative of intelligent design uh, for the purposes of this case. And so the history of that book became important, the arguments it made became important, and we uh, undertook to dissect these various aspects in preparation for the case. Motsky dug into pandas, examining it page by page, and scouring the internet to see what he could unearth about its history. Rummaging through the NCSE archives one day, Motsky came across a creationist student newspaper from 1981. At the bottom of the front page, he noticed a tiny article with a headline announcing unbiased biology textbook planned. And that article mentioned that a man named Charles Thaxton, now a fellow at the Discovery Institute, was working on a book that would present both evolution and creation. The academic editor was Charles Thaxton, who was the editor of the Pandas book. So it was clear that that ad was referring to the Pandas project. Um, what was interesting is that it talked about the book being about creation and evolution uh, instead of the later terms intelligent design and evolution. If they could show Pandas started out as a creationist book, that would suggest intelligent design is simply creationism repackaged and therefore inherently religious. 